Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Engineering of Future podcast. I am your host, Luis Duque. And this week, I bring a conversation with Fernando Cevallos. He's a fellow civil engineer who has an amazing career as a career coach, as a civil engineer, as a social media influencer, all these things that really align to what I want to do in my career, as well as the people that I want to bring to you on this podcast. So hopefully you guys enjoy the conversation with Fernando. He's a fantastic person. I've known him for about two, three months now. We connected on social media and I was able to interview him for the podcast. So hopefully you guys enjoy this conversation. Remember to subscribe to the podcast, rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or whatever you listen to podcasts. It helps spread the word and we can get a lot more people listening to the show, which is fantastic. Thank you so much for listening and let's get into the conversation for the week. Welcome to the Engineer Our Future podcast, a podcast where I bring you relevant content from personal experiences and guests to help young professionals, students, and international students succeed in their careers. So hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Engineer Our Future podcast. Today, I have Fernando. Um, He's another civil engineer that I came across recently, and he's doing a lot of great stuff. So I wanted to bring him to the podcast, and I'll let him introduce himself. No, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Um, so for the most part, I'll, I'll keep it brief. I know we're going to go deeper into, you know, a little bit about my background, but overall I work in, I've been working in civil engineering and land development specifically for the last six and a half years. I work for a company called Paved Austin Engineers in Texas and the DFW Metroplex um, as a whole, or in the DFW Metroplex. And, uh, you know, from the perspective of the, of the work that I do in land development, primarily has been commercial and um, industrial, uh, I guess, work. Yeah, and I've seen you do a lot of career coaching and um, on top of being a civil engineer, so I'm sure that takes a lot of your time. Uh, do you wanna go in a little bit in depth and what do you do and what kind of kind of coaching you, you've done in the past? Yeah, so, so the, a lot of the stuff that I do, I'm involved in the American Society of Civil Engineers and I'm involved with the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, so ASCE and uh, SHIP for short, right? And uh, through, throughout those years, you know, me being a first-generation student, first-generation college grad, a lot of the questions that we get um, are along the lines of, you know, I don't have anybody in my family who's been in this, in this situation. I have, I have nobody in my family to go to. And so a lot of the coaching that I end up doing is strategic planning on, on what can your career look like in the future. And I think some people might say, well, Fernando, you know, you're only six years into your career. What do you really know? Uh, But the thing is, I'm coaching people who are just getting started. And I think the goal is, how do I help people achieve better results than what I've achieved in the last six years? And so a lot of the work that I do is focused on that uh, leadership development, uh, personal development, professional development, public speaking, communication skills. And I also have a few clients that I work with that are a little bit more senior, uh, but it's just people who need that that leadership development. So a lot of the career coaching that that I do is along those lines. So it's mostly through um, the side of Hispanic professional engineers and ASC and, and just kind of people you come across in, in your career. Um, a lot right? of it is, is like the people that I, that I meet, right? Um, mm-hmm. Some people who say, because the thing is like everything we do is for free, right? And so we, we do it because we, we care. We do it because we want to see our communities grow. And so you give, 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 but you get to a point where it's, you know, I can only give so much, right? And I think what I, what I saw was there was a need, there was a gap. And what I made the decision was, you know, I'm going to continue to give plenty of hours to our community through these organizations. But once I hit a certain number, that's when I took on clients, right? Because the intention is, I think a lot of people want coaching. And I think the difference between the work that I do in these organizations is more mentorship. And so there's a difference between being tactical and strategic. And I think as a mentor, you know, my goal has always been, join an organization, uh, join a leadership position, get involved, network, that kind of thing. That's a mentorship advice. As a coach, it's more about, okay, you join this organization. How do I help you be more effective in the leadership role that you're in? How do we become more tactical? What are the steps? What are the things that you're doing? And so that requires a lot of attention and accountability. And I think that's kind of the reason why the difference between a mentor and a coach kind of comes into the things that I do. Right. And yeah, I think that's a very important distinction to make that a mentor a lot of times could be a coach, but there's a really kind of thin line between the two where coaching is more so like 
taking you through the different steps of your career and, and a, a mentor is more so like helping you through the career, but more in like a observing kind of position rather than taking a lot of action in, in what you're doing. Um, one of the things that I do a lot is volunteering again. Uh, I think you, you're pretty involved with ASC as well. Can you talk a little bit about what you do with ASC and kind of your positions and, and the things that you've been doing? Yeah, so I joined AAC back in 2009. So it's it's crazy to think that it's been a while, right? Uh, over 10 years. And I joined it as a student. And so my involvement in college was was different than what it is as a professional. Um, my involvement in school was more about the technical development. And now that I'm involved in AAC as a professional, it's still the technical component to it. But a lot of it is, um, I'm part of two committees. One of us is the, 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 the uh, diversity and inclusion committee. And the other one is a committee for pre-college outreach. And so what is the goal for that? Well, the goal is to create a more diverse, inclusive industry that we all work in. And so the only way we can do that is by being tactical and strategic on how we're going to go out there and talk to these kids and talk to people who don't come from the typical backgrounds. Uh, that I mean, you look at this, this you look at the statistics uh, and the demographics, and it's I mean it, it goes one way, right? And so when we look at the numbers, is how do we focus on trying to find ways to do that uh, through different programs and through, through different initiatives? And so the volunteer work that I do through the organization uh, with ACE is focused on national initiatives and national programs that we can implement the local branches uh, and local organizations. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not probably as involved as you are with ASC. And I kind of chose my, my career more to be focusing like the structure engineering Institute of ASC, which is still under the ASC umbrella. But I think the work that ASC does is, is super important. I think that pre-college outreach is one of the hardest and probably most important um, volunteer aspects that someone can do. Cause I know a lot of people, graduate from from high school or from college even and, and they kind of just get lost in what they want to do next um you mentioned one time when we talked last time that you mentor students and i don't remember if it was high school students through the society of, of hispanic professional engineers um and and you mentioned a statistics that i, I can't remember right now but like, like a lot of them kind of drop out and a lot of them don't really complete their their degree or once they do it they kind of drop out um, how have you been helping them and, and just talk a little bit about that experience of mentoring that, that people? Yeah, I think a lot of it is like, you know, people don't know what they don't know, right? And I think when you look at this, the statistics from a STEM uh, workforce, I believe it's 7 or 8% that are Hispanic. Uh, the rest of them are broken down to, to other demographics, right? Uh, it's the same thing for black. It's, it's pretty low down there. And so from a, from a success standpoint, I, and again, I'm I wish I, sh I can remember these facts a little bit better, but I think it's like, you know, 60% of the people who pursue, you know, um, a, a degree, they, they don't finish. And, and I think from that perspective, it, it makes it really tough because it's, you know, how do you, how do you make them graduate? And I think the common theme is they just don't have a, a strong foundation when it comes to um, the work ethic, right? They, they have it, they, they want to go after it. Uh, and it's not necessarily like a work ethic of they're not good enough. It's more of like, they just don't know how to study effectively. They put in the hours, but they're just not being effective. And I think it's also just the lack of networking. And, and I think there's a lot of emotional components along with it. And so some of the discussions that we have when some of these kids graduate high school and go to college, some of them take out grants to pay for their parents rent back at home. Um, because again, I am, I'm generalizing here and I'm talking about first generation students. Because those are the kids that I mentor. Uh, and a lot of them, it's, just, it's a big burden. Uh, some of them have to work two, three jobs, and it's, it's a lot. And so a lot of the work that we do is focused on making sure that those students who do pursue engineering uh, are graduating effectively and are graduating with a job. Because a lot of them, you know, another, another statistic is like a lot of them graduate, they get their first job, and they think that's good enough. And, and it's good, but, you know, we want you to do more. We want you to go to middle management. We want you to go to that you know, that executive role, which I'm, I'm aspiring to get to. But at the end of the day, a lot of the work that we do is focused on that, on, on making sure that people are moving forward with that growth mindset, if you will. Right. Yeah. I'm, I mean, coming from Colombia, I, I was born and raised in Colombia. So I know a little bit of the culture is, is completely different than what it's here. And, and I completely understand kind of where these students come from. And, and I, I was very fortunate that I was able to go to like a private school and come to the U.S. early on in my career. And 
I really don't take that for granted and I work hard every day to just improve myself and kind of help others. And I think that has shown in my resume. So I think that's a really important mission you're doing. And, and I think it's, it's great. Um, it's also like very win-win, right? Because, you know, a lot of people ask me, some of my peers ask me, you know, why do you do this work? Like, why are you just giving your time for free? And the thing it's like, I am, but I'm not because I'm getting something out of it. You know, me being able to have this conversation with you a few years ago, like, I mean, I still get nervous, but it's not that bad anymore uh, because I got the reps in, right? And so the more I talk to these kids, the more I practice and the more mistakes I make and the more comfortable I get. And so what's the parallel to my career? I get more comfortable talking to my peers and then I get more comfortable presenting new initiatives. And then by the time I know it, you know, I'm presenting to clients and taking on new, new responsibilities that my peers are not ready for. And, and why is that the case? Well, because I'm putting in the work. And some people might just say like, well, you're just giving away your time for free. Well, no, it, it's it, to me, it's a win-win because I'm helping them get perspective and I'm helping myself build those skills. Right. And I think that's a really important point that I personally haven't think that way before, but I mean, just doing this podcast or talking um, with more senior engineers or just being involved in different committees kind of, gives you a lot of value, not only like networking with all these people or, or meeting these, all these people, getting more opportunities in, in different conferences or ASE. And I mean, the, the amount of doors have, that have opened just for, from saying yes to one committee, to the next one, to the next one, just doors keep opening the more you kind of volunteer. And, and I don't consider that time wasted or, or time that I'm just giving away for free is, I'm, I'm definitely giving a lot of my time for free, but I'm getting a lot of value from all those experiences. And well, I mean, this industry is changing, right? I mean, some of the bosses that we have and some of the, the leaders that we have in our companies throughout the industry, like the concept of a personal brand is, is very, it's very new, right? Yeah. And so to them, it's, you know, why are you on social media and why are you doing this and why are you doing that? And, and a lot of it is like, we have to evolve. We have to be involved in these different social media platforms because if not, we're going to become a dinosaur and we're not going to evolve. And I think to, for, to your perspective, the more you get involved, the better your personal brand gets. And then people are able to say, you know what? I trust this guy because he's going to be able to do this work because I know what he, what he stands for. Because uh, if you don't do that, then I mean, then what really be, what really represents you uh, if you're not able to put your work in front of you? Right. And yeah, just kind of volunteering and, and opening doors kind of in front of you by saying yes. Um, and the other thing is, the more I volunteer and the more I help with like engineers board reporters and different organizations and, and such like that, like people will start recognizing you and, and inviting you to bigger and bigger things um, that are going to, again, build your brand and gain recognition. And then you're getting beat for even bigger things, um, which is, which is really great and, and gives a lot of perspective and, and that way you can help a lot more people, uh, which is, which is good. Um, one of the questions I had, and it's it's kind of funny because I never thought a civil engineer could be a career coach, and just because it's you always think of civil engineers as as such a introverted people that the way I I see an engineer and the way I'm sure a lot of people see engineers is people that are very technical are very focused on what they're doing which is definitely a big misconception. I've met a lot of engineers that are super extroverted or they're introverted. They like to do a lot of things outside. So I just want to ask you what has been that balance between being a civil engineer in the technical, a more um, kind of yeah technical area to being a career coach where you're teaching other people about leadership and all these soft skills that a lot of people think or a lot of people think that engineers don't really have. So how's been that kind of balance between those two? Yeah, I mean, I think a big one to your point, you know, a lot of engineers tend to be more introverted, tend to be more focused on the technical skills. But I think, you know, it's important to kind of define what each one of those things is. So what is an engineer? An engineer is someone who can solve problems, right? The easiest way to explain it. Um, and then from a career coach is what do they solve? They solve your career problems. And so from a perspective of like, what is it that I'm doing with parallels? I'm helping you develop a strategic brain, a strategic mindset on saying, what steps do I take? 
to get in a position to be able to be successful. And so when we look at a project, there's a lot of stakeholders involved. There's a schedule that we have to come up with, right? The critical path. There is a budget that we have to follow. And then there's all these different parameters that and constraints that we have to put into a project. And so from that perspective, it's similar thought and a similar uh, mindset of a career coach because I take Luis and I say, okay, he comes from Colombia. He has his experience. Uh, this is, this is his aspirations. These are his constraints. He has a family. He has a, two kids. And so I'm pulling all these different parameters. And so I'm coming up with a plan that is tactical in the regard to how do we help Luis develop his passions and pursue different projects that can help him build himself that are going to able to build his resume to be able to pursue new opportunities at work that are going to parlay to his career. Right. And so from that perspective, that's kind of how I see it. Right. From the perspective of the, what are they the same as far as like how I balance it, my career comes first. Right. So I'm a civil engineer first and foremost. And most of my time, you know, is focused on, on that, uh, what is it, 40 to 60 hours, right, on average. And so from that perspective, like that is my, my commitment to my, my career. Now, what happens outside of work? You know, I have other hobbies. I like photography. I have a podcast. Uh, I like the career coaching. And so to me, it's just pursuing passion projects. Some people like doing woodworking. Some people go out drinking every other night. Uh, for me, it's I like working with people because the reason I pursued civil engineering was to help my community right? To help the world that we live in. And so what better way to do that by helping people become better people. And so that's kind of the reason why I pursued that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I think you and I are very similar in the way we think. And I kind of think that's one of the reasons we kind of first connected uh, a few months ago and, and yeah, just kind of helping people and being involved with ASE and all these different organizations is, is really great. Um, I just want to hear a lot, a little bit more what, what, kind of other volunteering experience you have had and and kind of what skills you have been able to develop through those volunteer experiences yeah so the the bill that comes to mind i mean the big one is for me is is ship right uh, it's a society of hispanic professional engineers so i kind of went over like the work that i do with ace and for me like that's that's kind of what it comes down to is just that commitment to helping bring more people to civil engineering uh, and through that i'm involved with future city as a judge. And so I go to the competitions and help kids give more exposure to civil engineering. But with SHIP, you know, I've been committed to that organization since 2014. And uh, in that org, I've been able to become a better leader. I've been able to work on my public speaking skills. I've been able to work on my schedule, my time management skills, like all these different things that uh, in a way are required to be a successful project manager. And so I've had the platform to make the mistakes in SHIP. And now I'm able to bring them to work and say, hey, I know how to do marketing. I know how to do partnerships. I understand the, the, how to do proposals. I understand how to do, you know, uh, schedules and budgets. And these are all things that just now I'm supposed to be getting into my career, right? But there are things that I've been doing for years in SHIP because of the organization. And so through the organization, I've helped le led uh, local teams and local professional chapters. I've helped lo uh, lead regional teams through my regional uh, organiz or through the regional positions. And uh, I've also helped national committees. And so on the regional side, uh, I was fortunate to be the regional vice president for two years. And I, I had the opportunity to work with 3,200 students or 3,200 members. And so what that is, you know, you have remote teams, you have to work with initiatives, you have to understand what are best practices in one, com in one organization or one chapter versus another. And so again, I'm going into the details, but all of these different things that I've been able to get exposed to go back to my career, right? And so those are kind of the skills that I think I value the most is, is for sure my communication skills because effective communication is huge. And I think also my leadership skills because I've learned how to make the mistakes there. And so now I know don't make these assumptions. Don't, don't talk to people like this. Don't call them out here um, because I was a young leader, right? And so now that I'm able to say, okay, in my company, you don't talk to people like this. And if you need to talk to an introvert, you don't call them out and keep them accountable in front of a group. You talk to them in one by one. And these are all things that to your point, as an introvert, sometimes engineers, they don't understand emotional intelligence and they just think, well, you just got to do the job and that's that. And it's not that simple. Right. Um, so for the people, the first students kind of going into school right now, I just want to ask you a really serious question. <laughs> Were you 
like a natural gifted engineer, a natural gifted leader when you started school? <laughs> well, yes and no. I, I feel like I've always been, I've always been good at, at like people with people. Right. Um, so I played sports in high school. I was involved in organizations in high school. Uh, and when I joined college, I was super involved in like a bunch of orgs. Uh, but from a perspective of like being comfortable or like being a natural engineer, no, not at all. Um, I, I failed some classes, right? Oh, I didn't get an F, but I got I got two Ds in high school, in college, um, and a lot of Cs, right? And there's a couple of A's. And so, from the perspective of like being a really good engineer, when it comes to like school, if you define an, a good engineer that way, then the answer is no. But to me, an engineer is not just someone who can crank out testing, right? And who can pass a test. To me, it's it's way more than that. And so, I think it's just like the the matter of defining what a good engineer means. Uh, but, but if I were to define it the way we're defining it right now, uh, probably not. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I, I think it's a silly question and I think you got, you got the right answer because a lot of people think you have to be so good at math even before you start, or you have to be, um, this amazing person, super intelligent to be a great engineer. And, and the reality is once Bro, you I'm graduate, dyslexic. yeah, right. So yeah. So once you graduate, you have all these resources at hand, to be a good engineer, but then if you focus all your career as a as a student to all the technical skills and don't develop the soft skills, the leadership, the uh, listening, or the uh, communication, once you graduate, there are a thousand people, maybe even more, yeah. that know the technical skills. But the real good engineers are the ones that communicate effectively, are leaders, and have all these soft skills that are gonna. Um, bring them to kind of the management position. And, and recently I posted something on Instagram about how I failed my place, placement exam when I went to, I, I first started school. So I started in college algebra, which if you're an engineer, like algebra is probably the easiest class you will ever take in your life. And mm -hmm. I was able to, I was, I was sad. I was devastated when I basically failed that exam, but I knew this was an opportunity to grow. So I kind of took that, mastered that algebra, followed the next class and, and kind of ended up getting a, a minor in math. So I just want a lot of people to realize that the technical skills can be learned um, and you'll have them at your disposal once they graduate, but the soft skills are a lot more important to really be a, a good engineer. You have to communicate with people, with clients, with contractors, with other people. So I think that's a, that's a really it, powerful skill to have. Yeah, and, and it starts in school, right? I mean, if you're a freshman, you're a sophomore, if you're not finding study groups, like you're failing yourself. And I think to your point, like being able to develop those skills is, is critical because there's going to be days where you don't go to class and you're going to have to find somebody else to give you your notes. You're going to have to find the person who's like super, super smart, who's going to help you tutor you to do certain classes because whenever, when it comes down to doing presentations for your whole team, that person's going to struggle because they don't want to present in front of the class, but that's where you shine. Right. And so everybody has their, their, they're valuing a team, but it's just a matter of you understanding what value you bring. Uh, but, but yeah, I think you bring up a really valid point that you don't have to be super good at math uh, and everything else. Cause at the end of the day, you just have to be able to do the job. Right. Yeah. And, and we I use software when we, once we graduate. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's super important just to realize that the math skills and the engineering skills are important, but at the end of the day, you will probably spend, I, I think right now, even early on in my career, I spend a lot of the time talking to people, talking to uh, my coworkers or talking to clients and such, and some of that time doing engineering. But um, the more advanced you get in your career, the less math you do. Like at least you know a lot crazy? more management. I feel like you and I are vibing, and, but other engineers would say, oh, you guys are so wrong. Like you, you have, you do so much math and if you're not good at math, you're not going to be successful. And I can understand where they're coming from, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not a matter of like, you have to be really good at it. You have to just be able to do it. Right. And I think that's the message that we're both trying to get at is, is people have to get comfortable, understand that math will be involved. And if you hate math, I don't know if this is for you. Right. But if you're not super good at it, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of problem solving and, um, just critical thinking and these other skills that are around math, but it's not the only thing that people need to know when mm -hmm. they're going to school. Um, so I've seen you, you do a lot of talks and, and um, different 
opportunities. You have given a series of talks. One of them really caught my attention with watch, which was on leadership. Um, I think you call it like one of your signature talks. Would you mind giving us a little bit snippet of what that talk uh, looks like and kind of what the points you, you make in that talk? Yeah. So like the big one for, for that is, is like becoming a leader within yourself. Right. And so the things that I talk about is finding your why, finding your tribe, and then making, making a uh, failing and moving forward and pivoting if needed. Right. So it's like the, the three main themes of the talk. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's all about like, so I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, um, I'm a big follower of Jocko Willink. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Uh, he, he, he's in the military. He's an ex seal. Um, and he talks about this thought process of discipline equals freedom and extreme ownership. And so a lot of the talk that I talk about is focused on that is taking full accountability of your actions. And so as an individual leader, I think a lot of people will become a victim. They talk about the things that have happened to them and the reasons why they can't be successful. And they start finding all these different reasons for why they can't succeed in their career or early on in their career, finding a job or whatever the case is. And so in that discussion that I have is focused on making sure that people take full accountability of their actions and ensure that they're taking the hold of their career. Uh, a lot of times when I do this discussion, and so the leadership talk is, is kind of a, a, a common regardless of who I talk to, but I tailor it to the audience. And so if you're early on in your career and you graduated college, a lot of the things that I hear to people say is, well, my company is going to take care of me. They're going to teach me what I need to learn. They're going to put me in position to be successful. If I put my head down and work, it's going to be good enough and I'm going to do my job. And that's not the case, right? Mm -hmm. And so from the discussion of leadership is people have to take full accountability of their, of their job. They have to do their job and a little bit more because when people don't get promoted, people don't get promo uh, raises, they say, well, why don't you, what am I getting a raise? I'm doing my job, right? You're doing your job. If you do a little bit more, then you deserve a little bit more. And the more you grow, the more you get. Uh, when I talk to students who are pursuing college, it's focused on like, are you taking full, a, a full, full advantage of the opportunities you have right now in school? Are you involved in organizations? Are you pursuing, you know, different opportunities in your summers? Are you just goofing off? Are you just messing around? Like, what are you doing? And if the answers are, well, I'm enjoying my summer. And then when they don't get a job, they're going to be complaining, well, tough shit, like that's your fault, right? Um, and so if they're not involved, that's kind of the talk focused on is, is taking full accountability and becoming a victor rather than a victim. Yeah, I think that's that's super important. And one of the things that caught my attention was if you work, do your work, you'll deserve to pay, be paying what you're getting right now. But if you do a little bit more, you'll be getting a lot more paid. And I think that's super important, not only because – I think a lot of engineers and, and just people in general think that um, if they do their work, that's all they need to do. But then they go home and, and work is over. And a lot of times, and at least in the other company that was and the, the one I was before, I was a lot of times the only engineer there after hours, some of the days, because you have to do submit a proposal or submit a, a report or you have a deadline that you have to, to meet. And a lot of people think that's that's not realistic or that's way too much to do and, and that's out of the ordinary, which it's not. You have to, sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit and give a little bit more to yourself to kind of meet those deadlines and meet what you need to accomplish. The, the biggest difference that I tell people is the difference between having a job and a career, right? When you have a job, you just do your job. You clock in and you clock out. When you have a career, you do your work. You focus on what you want to pursue. You don't use the word job. You use the word, you know, this is my career. This is my work. This is my passion. This is my lifestyle. And to your point, like you're in and you, you don't go home until the job is done. And right. I think a lot of people, it's like, I did what I needed to do. Hey, can you help me with this? That's not my job. Who says that, right? Those <laughs> are people who, who don't want to succeed. And again, the biggest message that I want to give people is that's okay. If you just want to have a job, that's completely okay. Like I'm not trying to discredit you or say that you're less than, but the, the biggest thing about my talks and the, some of the coaching that I do is focused on, you can't tell me you want more if you don't put in more work or put, put in more uh, effort. Right. And so to your point is, is you, you have to put it in, right? If you want to be a professional engineer, like the definition of being a professional is someone who is committed to their craft. And, and if you just want to have a job, like, 
you know gonna have some problems yeah uh, this, it's it takes a lot of work um what was what would be one thing you do differently growing up that you regret or or not even like regret maybe you you wanted to change that will be like different from your past um like to become a better person right now or or if you could choose a different path of of like growing up what would that be you, so I want to make sure I don't go on a tangent. Do you think it's like, you know, early elementary years, like elementary through high school or more college or, or do you, or how do you want me to answer that question? Well, anywhere, like, do you, do you think even like, yeah, I went to this school, but if I had gone to this school, maybe I will have lived in this part of the country and I'll be doing this type of work or meet these kind of people. Like if there's something in your life that you think could have been different that, maybe you will have wanted to see reflected right now? Well, I mean, you know, early on, just for context, like, you know, I grew up in very humble beginnings. And so the upbringing that I had was very entrepreneurial. Um, I used to use the word poor, right? Because we were below the poverty line and I was raised and, and I was born in one of the poorest cities in the country. And so, you know, growing up, like it wasn't easy. Uh, I was loved by my mom. My grandma was there. I had a good family. And so from that perspective, I was extremely blessed. And so from an early age, like seven or eight years old, my mom taught me to knock on doors to sell tamales mm -hmm. and tacos and cake. And so it was either that or we don't pay the bills, right? And so from an early age, like she taught me the value of going out there and putting in the work. So I think from that perspective, I wouldn't really change much from the exposure that I got. And then you start going into middle school. Um, you know, some of my involvements, like I, was, I played sports, so like there's really not a lot of regret there. Um, Chess was like a big part of my life too. It's like, that's definitely not a regret. High school is very involved. I think fast forward, like I gave all that context to, there's really like a, not a lot that was in my control or that was things that were in my control that could have changed that would have put me in a drastic, uh, you know, um, path. I think I'm very blessed to like say K through 12 was awesome. In college, I think if there was maybe any regret would be like finances, um, maybe diving deeper into personal finances because i mean i didn't come out of college with a lot of money with a lot of debt like it's it's pretty good compared to a lot of people but i think i could have been a lot more aggressive and more frugal in some of the things that i did to have put me in better position when i graduated uh, college to be more um because i have aspirations to like buy real estate and i think i could have been there by now if i would have been a little bit more uh committed to my finances in college yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a great point. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people, like in my case, I don't really regret not doing anything like big before. Cause I know like even the big mistakes that I did when I was little or growing up or in school or something, those are the things that really got me to where I am right now. And the really like the big experiences that the experience of failure or success or all the things that I was able to accomplish or all the things that I didn't accomplish I really the things that got me to this point. So I'm happy to hear that you didn't really have a lot of regrets because that shows you that, that, I mean, that shows me that even though there were probably a lot of failures early on in your career or a during lot. college or anything, I mean, those failures are really the things that got you to where you are right now. So yeah, yeah I think that, that was a great answer. Um, I think, you know, one other one is like, you know, me being dyslexic, I failed first grade, right? So some people yeah. would say like, wouldn't you regret that? I'm like, I mean, if I could have changed it, I would have changed it, right? But, you know, there's, I'm dyslexic. Like, it is what it is. And, and I think a lot of it, too, is, you know, being completely comfortable with who you are. And, and I think that's, like, a big lesson, too, in all of this career development is being comfortable with who you are and just owning it and just trying to be a little bit better every single day. Have you, have you noticed, like, dyslexia has been an impediment to anything you've done in your life or has been, like, something that has helped you overcome maybe all the things that that you wouldn't do otherwise i would say both i would say it's been uh it's been a problem and it's also been a blessing because you know i mean i fell first grade and i keep saying the same thing because like that was like the biggest like challenge right of being dyslexic they just failed me um and i think go going in growing up um the first couple of years like i couldn't write i couldn't read i had, I had trouble with a lot of things um, ESL, right? So English is a second language. Um, Spanish was my first language. And so a lot of that, like being dyslexic, 
gave me trouble. But at the same time, the way I think is different than everybody else. And I think from a communication standpoint, it's a good thing, but that's a bad thing because I think backwards. I think with the end in mind and I start coming forward or towards the beginning and some people don't like that, right? Or sometimes I talk in circles because I feel like I'm, I need to make my point because one of my biggest fears is being misunderstood. And so I don't know if that's my dyslexic brain causing me to be that way, um, but I'm going to say that it is. But I think it's a benefit because as an engineer, you have to reverse engineer a lot of things. And so because I'm able to think that way, it's a huge you know, benefit, and at least in my eyes, because I can bring a different perspective in my projects and in my teams. I think, yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I struggle a lot seeing like the end of a project or the end of a design. And if I call, I wanted to start from the end and kind of, like I said, reverse engineer everything and come to the start and start working from there. So I think that's definitely a, a good skill to have. And uh, they also say like, you know, people who are dyslexic can think better in 3D elements or like 3D, like they can visualize things better. Mm. So I feel like I, I'm pretty good at that. So I don't know if that's just me or if it's actually because I'm just like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely a, a big positive to be an engineer. I know we use that a lot, mm -hmm. uh, trying to kind of reverse engineer the things that we are working on. Um, so it looks like we're kind of running out of time. So I just wanted to ask you, what's a, a big advice you give or, or you will you'll give a senior student that is looking to graduate in civil engineering or any kind of engineering field? I mean, the biggest advice I can give to people is network. I mean, you, you have to make more connections. You have to be more intentional with who you know, uh, build your resume, start making those relationships now, you know, find seniors who already graduated, um, find super seniors, right? Find people who, who you maybe had a relationship with in college who are now working in the industry and start making those relationships with them now. Um, I think if you're a senior, you're in your first semester and you have maybe a year after you graduate, don't start looking for a job when it comes down to March, April, May, right? Because it's going to mm -hmm. be too late. You have to start now. Uh, I think the, the longer you wait, the more disservice you do to yourself. And the other one is just get comfortable being who you are. Uh, and, and I keep saying that, but what I mean by that is if you have a resume that's on paper and you think you're this perfect person, but you really don't, you know, uh, reflect to that or you really don't represent that, I think that's a huge disservice to yourself. And so what I want people to really take away from this you know, message is figure out what, what's who you are on paper, but really know what you bring to the table. When someone tells, asks you the question, you know, why are you an engineer? Why are you pursuing this job? Like you have to know your why. And I think that that's the, the biggest message is people need to fundamentally know why they're wanting to do what they're doing. And I think that's like the best message I can give to people who are in school, regardless of their civil or anything else. Yeah, I think that's that's a great advice. Um, well, another question I like to ask people, like bring to the podcast, is uh, what can what books do you recommend, and what books have changed your either your changed your life or changed your perspective on on certain topics? I would say um, the Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz is is a huge book on personal development and also understanding um, personal accountability. I think that's a good one for anybody who's trying to go into the personal development space. Uh, Start with why with Simon Sinek is a really good book. Again, going back to the why yeah. he kind of, you know, puts it into in pretty good context um, on understanding like why you have to do certain things. And then the other one is extreme ownership um, by Jocko Willing and Leif Babif. I can never say his name right, uh, <laughs> but that's a really good book as well. Yeah, I've heard one of those, so I'm excited to to maybe read the other ones. Um, so just a final question, how can we better engineer our future? Reverse engineer it, figure out where you're trying to go and then work backwards. Um, if you know where you're headed, you know what you need to work on. Yeah, perfect skills over for a lot of engineers. It's it's a wonderful thing to, I, I mean, all the work we do is, is complicated and, and the more we can think ahead, the more problems we save down the road. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Where can people find you, uh, social media or other things you've been doing? Yeah. So people can follow me on Instagram or on YouTube. Uh, they just find, Google my name or Google my name or look it up on the, on the Instagram or YouTube. They can find it, uh, Fernando Ceballos. And then uh, I also go by my, my username is FDO Ceballos, FDO standing for short for Fernando. And then I also have a podcast called Dealing with Life Stuff podcast. 
And so we talk a lot about uh, career and just personal growth and ph uh, philosophy with my co-host. And so if people want to, you know, connect with, the, connect with us there, they can definitely do so. Yeah, I'll we'll link those in the show notes below and and description and everything, so people can find you. Thank you so much, Fernando, for coming to the podcast. And um, again, we've been doing a lot of similar things, which is wonderful. And I'm glad we connected when we did. Yeah, thanks for having me, Luis. So there you have it. Today's episode with Fernando. He's an amazing civil engineer, amazing career coach, and amazing. All these things that he's doing is amazing to, to hear and really resonate with me because I'm trying to do some of the same things that he's doing. So we really connected. We met on, on Instagram a few weeks ago. I've heard of him from, from, the, from ASE and from all organizations that he's involved with, uh, from, from all our friends that we have in common. And I was very happy to get him on the podcast and uh, have him share all his experiences and and just really share so much values with all of you so hopefully you enjoyed the episode and and give fernando a follow and go check out his when you go check out his youtube channel he has some really interesting and valuable advice for students young engineers and and just engineers in general as you may hear we have some new music in background today I'm very grateful for my friend Jack Winders to let me use some of his music. He's an amazing artist and one of my great friends from college. So give him a follow. Uh, all the links are in the description below. Uh, he has a new album coming up pretty soon. So make sure you check him out. He's on Spotify. I've linked everything again on the description below. Uh, this is one of his, mu his songs from his previous album uh, called Horseplay. Um, yeah amazing person an amazing friend i'm glad he, he was able to let me use some of his music for for the show so that's all i have for today make sure you subscribe to the podcast on apple Podcasts, spotify anywhere you listen to podcasts rate and review the show it really helps to get the word out there and have other people find the show on on their platform so so yeah thank you so much for coming back for this episode i'll talk to you on the next one but for now let's continue engineering our future